Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. Faith Bridge today as we come to the third and final part of this series we've been doing called Salt and Light. <clears throat> so welcome if you're here at the Klein campus. Welcome if you're at the Woodlands campus. Thanks for all you're doing up there. And welcome if you're watching online on this Time Change Sunday. Glad that you can be a part of what's going on here at Faith Bridge today. Turn in your Bibles, and we're going to go to Acts chapter 8, okay? Acts chapter 8 in the New Testament. If you need a Bible, just sort of raise your hand, and some ushers are coming down, and they'll be glad to uh, give you a Bible regardless of what room you're sitting in. And you can keep the Bible. If you don't have one, you keep it. It's our gift to you. Before we look at Acts chapter 8 and what happens there, uh, let's just recap uh, for a moment. We've uh, talked the past two Sundays about salt and light particularly last Sunday, if you happen to be here, you heard a message from Martin Durham of England, and he brought a very powerful message about evangelism and, and inspiring us and challenging us and exhorting us to go and to share our faith with everybody. And uh, many of you left here and you felt very inspired and motivated and just so excited to go and tell people, everybody you know about Jesus. On the other hand, a number of you left here feeling maybe a little bit intimidated, a little bit overwhelmed because it's like, oh my gosh, I don't do that. I mean, I know I kind of felt a little bit that way. I was thinking throughout the week of some of his illustrations. He talked about, uh, remember how he talked about how he, he would go down to downtown London on cold Friday nights and stand among the taxi cab drivers and just sort of befriend them and, and he would lead them to Jesus. And I thought, I've never gone and hung out with taxi cab drivers and led them to Jesus. And then he talked about how the telemarketers come, call from India and they're trying to sell him something. And, and after they finish, then he says, well, now let me tell you about Jesus. And he leads them to Jesus. I thought, I've never done that with a telemarketer. I'm usually trying to figure out how can I hang up the phone. And then he talked about how, he's, how he prays when he's getting on an airplane. Now, Lord, just bless the person who's going to sit here in this seat and just help me to lead him to Jesus. I'm thinking to myself, when I get on an airplane, I'm praying, Lord, Lord would you just please leave this seat empty so I can have some extra leg room? And, I, and so I left the sermon thinking last week, goodness gracious, I've got a long ways to go. And I bet that a number of you kind of felt that way. So I want to pick up sort of where we left off last week. And I can't give us an out. Okay, so it's not a pass. It's like, so therefore, you don't have to worry about it. No, no, no. We're called, all of us are called to go into the world and make disciples. So we are called to do this thing called evangelism. It's just that some of us find ourselves... And uh, I don't know, just the way that you're wired, you're, you're naturally good at it. It just naturally comes out of you. And if that's the case, then you probably don't need this sermon. You just go on your way and keep doing what you're doing. This message I wrote for the rest of us who sort of just feel maybe like we're a little step behind when it comes to this thing called sharing our faith, talking about Jesus, evangelism, and all this stuff. We, we know we ought to do it, but we draw back because I don't know if I'll do it well, and then you feel guilty. And say, Sorry. This message is for you. Okay, so in Acts chapter 8, <clears throat> I want to read to you, and then uh, I want to make some observations from the text, which I think will be very instructive and helpful. Uh, for you and me as we go from here 
today. Okay, I'm going to read it to you, and then we'll talk about the, the passage. Acts chapter 8, starting in 26. Now, an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandaki, which means queen of Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading a book of Isaiah, the book of Isaiah the prophet. And the spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. And then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet and said, do you understand what you're reading? And the eunuch said, how can I unless someone explains it to me? So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. Quote, he was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. And the eunuch asked Philip, tell me, please, who is this prophet talking about? Himself or someone else? And then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. And as they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, stop, or rather, look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. And then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. So three observations I want to make from the text as we discuss um, evangelism today. If you're a note taker, three things that we're going to uh, talk about. The first one is this. When it comes to evangelism, friends, I think it's very helpful to realize it's really not about you. It's really not about you. And, and what I mean by that is, is I, I think so often we find ourselves maybe getting into a conversation and, and we think, oh my gosh, I know I need to talk about Jesus. I don't want to botch it up. I, want to, I don't want to say the wrong thing. And, and we just start focusing so much on ourself. It's really not about you. Anybody can do this, and I'll prove it. Do you know who Philip was? This Philip who we're reading about today. He was not the Philip of the 12 disciples. This is a different Philip. And actually, he pops up in the book of Acts two chapters earlier. And an interesting thing, I'll tell you the history of, of, of where this Philip came from. So the church, after Jesus had gone back to heaven, the church is exploding in growth. And people are coming to Christ and getting baptized and more and more people. And it's exciting. And look at what God's doing. And, and when the church grows, things change. And when things change, people get their feelings hurt. And change is kind of hard for everybody. And, and that's exactly what was going on here. And, and one of the people that are the groups that was feeling a little bit slighted were the widows, it says in Acts chapter 6. Because the widows were saying, oh, all these new people are coming in and they're getting saved and you're not taking care of us, the widows, like you used to take care of us. I mean, you used to talk with us and have time for us and you give us food and that was really nice. But, but now you're just out there and there's just more people coming and you're preaching. And, and so the 12 disciples, it says in Acts chapter 6, they had a little, a little meeting and they got together and said, we got to solve this problem. And it wouldn't be right for us to divert off course from, from preach, preaching the word and, and getting the gospel out. We, we've got to keep going forward with what Jesus said. But this is a problem. And, and we do have to take care of the widows. And that, that's part of what God's word says too. And, but we, we can't do that. There's only so many hours of the day. And we, we, we got to do the word. And, but who's going to do this? And so they chose seven people, Acts chapter 6 says, who would take care of the widows and wait on them and serve them food. You know who one of those seven was? Philip. You say, what's that have to do? Oh, that has a lot to do with it. Because see, I think a lot of times we tend to think the only people who can really go out and evangelize, it's, 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 it's like, it's you professional preachers. You, you get paid to do that. You're good at that. It's natural. It just sort of comes out of you. And, but I'm an ordinary person. No, no, see, that's what the text is saying. Philip's like, well, uh, you, I waited tables. That's, that's who he was, a, a table waiter for the widows. 
It's not to say that he probably couldn't have maybe given a little sermon himself, but obviously the disciples didn't feel like he, that was his real gift, to, to get out front like Peter, James, John, Paul, these guys that were gonna go out and just preach to thousands of people. No, they said to Philip, you know, Philip, you're, you're wiring your temperament, your patience. It seems like this is the right thing, the right ministry for you to be doing. You're gonna take care of the widows and serve them food. This is the Philip who's gonna do evangelism with this eunuch as they're riding along, okay? If he can do it, you can do it. You wait tables, hmm, you're qualified, all right? Anybody's qualified. So <clears throat> that's the first thing that I wanted to talk about. Oh, and, and before we move on, let me just say this also, when we're talking about this thing about it, it's not all about you. I think it's really important that we remember when it comes to sharing our faith and talking about Jesus and evangelism and, and all, there's, there's actually two parties at work here. Okay? We tend to think it's all up to me, it's up to me. No, 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 no. God is saying, would you stop it? It's up to me. God's saying, you know, I'm the one in charge of this. You're just the mouthpiece. You're just the messenger. But, but I'm the one who's sending. I'm the one who's kind of behind this. And so would you just relax? It's, it's really not about you. It's really about me, the Lord is, is saying. And, and that's why he gives us these nudgings, these promptings to sort of say, why don't you go this way? Why don't you say this? Why don't you have a conversation with that person? They look like they might be ready to have a conversation. And you see those promptings and those nudgings in this passage, right? You see it in verse 27. The, uh, it says that he said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. And then verse 29, again, go to that chariot and stay near it. Incidentally, commentators agree that the Holy Spirit and the angel of the Lord are used synonymously here, just for these promptings that he was giving um, to, to Philip. But you can't miss the Lord's involvement. He was the one who was doing it. It wasn't Philip. Philip was just being responsive and receptive to, to following the nudgings uh, that God was giving to him. I think it's freeing to realize it's really all about him. It's not about you. We just get to be the messengers for him. Second observation I want to make from the text. It's not even about your presentation. It's not even about your presentation. It's about the preparation of the seeker's heart. The preparation of the seeker's heart. See, I don't know about you, but sometimes I, I have talked about Jesus and I just had the sense, I, I said it as well as I could say it, as clear as I could say it, and, and I just got the sense that he was like, hmm, I don't care, now let's talk about the Texans. And I'm like, what did I do wrong, God? I, and you kind of can get feeling like, it's my fault. No, 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 no. It's not so much about your presentation as it is about the preparation of the individual's heart. You remember that story that Jesus told of the seeds or, or the farmer? And he talked about this farmer who, who went out and he's scattering the seeds onto the ground. And he's just scattering and scattering. And, <clears throat> and Jesus says, now the interesting thing about that, the seeds fell in different places. Some of the seeds fell on the footpath and some of the seeds fell on the rocky soil and some of the seeds fell on the thorny ground and some of the seeds fell on the fertile soil. And Jesus goes on and he gives spiritual interpretation to that. And that's not the sermon that we're going to talk about today or the text that we're talking about. But the point that I'm making is this. In only one situation did the seed sprout and grow. It's the same seed, one different seed, same seed. What was uh, different? The soil. If it fell on the rocky, if it fell on the pathway, it's not gonna, nothing's going to happen there. The fertile soil. That's what made it happen. Everybody's heart represents a certain type of soil. And I think that's important when we're having a spiritual conversation with somebody to remember, hey, you know, it's really not up to me. It's not even up to my presentation. It's really about the preparation that God's doing in this person's heart. And it doesn't matter if, if that person's heart is hard, you could just be the best evangelist. You could be Billy Graham and it's not going to get in because their heart just isn't, it's just it's just not wanting the seed of the gospel. On the other hand, 
you could really botch it up. I, a time or two I can think of in my own life when I've shared the gospel and, and I'm saying the wrong things. And I'm you know, I sort of messing the whole thing up and, and I get to the end and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, goodness gracious, I could not have bungled that up more. And the person's like, I want that. I'm like, you do? After, oh my heaven. Yes, I want Jesus. I, I understood. Really? After all of that? Which just goes to show it's not about your presentation. It's about the preparation of that person's heart. You find a person whose heart is soft and who is ready, and the seed of the gospel just goes in and begins to take root. Okay? And so, <clears throat> back to the text. What's happening here? The Holy Spirit is leading Philip to this man whose heart is soft, soft soil. He says, go up to him. Now, the scripture says he was a eunuch. And that always brings up a few questions, so we need to talk about that uh, for just a moment, okay? What was a eunuch? Well, basically, a eunuch was a man who had been emasculated. And you say, well, that, why does the Bible have to be so graphic about that? Let me give, give you the, 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 the background. It's, it's, it, it actually plays into the story here. You see, in that day and age... Men who were in the highest echelons of power, of royalty, of military, they tended to all be eunuchs unless they had been born into that status. You say, why? I'll tell you why. Because the people who had been born into the royalty, into the power, and so they didn't trust any other man to come into that highest rank along with them, especially trust with their women, unless they became eunuchs. Because that's a game changer, you know? And, and so, <laughs> I don't know how else to say it. And, and, so, and, it, and so you know that this man, this eunuch, he is, in fact, in the highest echelons. It says he's, he's from Ethiopia, and he was the, the keeper of the treasury of the Kandaki. What is that? It, the better way to say it would be, or a simpler way for us in English would be Candace. And a Candace meant the queen, sort of like the Pharaoh meant the king. And so he kept the queen's money. And, and you know that he had a little extra because why? Well, because first of all, he's in a chariot. And second of all, he's reading from the scroll of Isaiah. And not just anybody could just go out and get a scroll of Isaiah. That was 29 feet long and had leather. And I mean, it's a big deal. And for that matter, hardly anybody could read. So you know he was learned and, and he could actually read. And, and you know that he had some pecking order because he would, oh, that was a bad pun. And, and so, you, <laughs> pardon me about that. And, and so you know that he had some influence that he could actually go to Jerusalem. Just keep going. Just keep coming with me. He could go to Jerusalem and have the time away from Ethiopia to, to, to get away. That was, that was no short journey, right? So you know uh, all of this factors into the story. Now let's come back to it. So this man had gone to Jerusalem to worship. So you know he's a spiritual seeker. He's gone all the way. He's used all of the influence that he had so he could get away. He says, I've got to go to Jerusalem. I've got to figure this thing out. And so he's gone all the way to Jerusalem to worship. And on his way home, was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. And the spirit says to Philip, go up to that chariot and stay near it. And then Philip ran up to the chariot and he heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. And Philip asked, do you understand what he's talking about? Incidentally, anybody who read, the ancients all read aloud. Even if they're by themselves, they always, oh, they always just read aloud. Not many people could read. That's just how they did it. Um, and so he hears what he's reading. He says, do you understand what you're reading? How can I? Unless somebody explains it to me. So Philip was invited to say, what? I can explain it to you. He comes up in the chariot and begins to explain. Now, verse 32, in this passage, uh, this is what he was reading. He was like a sheep led to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he didn't open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. And the eunuch asked Philip, tell me, please, 
who is the prophet talking about here? Is he talking about himself or is he talking about somebody else? And don't you know when he was saying, is he talking about somebody else? He was perhaps thinking like me. Do you think he was talking about somebody else like me? Isaiah, because don't you know that his unspoken question would have been because I kind of feel like this person, I was a lamb, a very lamb, and I underwent brutal surgery that would make me safe for the king's court. And, and because of that, I'll never have any descendants. And my life was, was all but taken from me here on earth. Could he have been talking about somebody like me? And just at that moment, Philip says, got any questions about what you're reading? Incidentally, some of the best conversations about the gospel, about Jesus, evangelism, happen because of a well-asked question, a well-timed question. Jesus did it all the time. He was always leading with a question. Who do you say that I am? Do you really want to be well? And Paul would do it as well. Uh, comes along in, in Acts 19 and, and says, now, what baptism did you receive? Oh, you know what? There's actually been another one that's come after that. Let me tell you about Jesus. Okay? Leading with the question. You can do this. Uh, for, for example, you see somebody who has a nice pair of earrings, and there's a cross on them. You say, I like your jewelry. Incidentally, I noticed there's, it's a cross. And so I was just wondering, what does the cross mean to you? a good question. I wrote down several other questions. Maybe when somebody's in times of suffering, you say, you ask, you know, I was just wondering, in the midst of all that you've been going through, does it feel to you like God is farther away than ever or closer than ever? That's a good question. You can have a real good conversation out of that. Maybe at times of death or even stories of death. or You know, I was wondering, what do you think about the afterlife? You ever give that any thought? Hmm. You ever wonder about spiritual things? You religious? Person says, Yes, actually, I am. Really? Tell me about your religion. Person says, no. You say, well, me either. I'm about a relationship with Jesus. I'm not religious. One, I like, have you ever attended a church that ordinary people like to attend? Because I can tell you about one. <laughs> what do you turn to um, when you're most discouraged are feeling isolated. Uh -huh. have, you ever, have you ever wondered how good is good enough for God? You ever wondered that? You mind if I pray for you? <laughs> One I've used a lot lately especially if I know the person. Have you heard about the story about how I almost died last month? <laughs> let me tell you, but let me warn you, you will become a believer in the one true God who is good and who is loving and providential. Sit down, let me tell you the story. <laughs> so it's just, you know, well-timed questions can, can open up all sorts of good conversation because everybody has spiritual questions and in that regard, the eunuch is just like everybody. Yeah, everybody, they might say, well, I don't really have spirit. Yes, they do. Everybody has spiritual questions deep down in their soul. The question is, are, are you taking the time to just ask, to, to, to place a, 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 a well-timed question? That's what Philip did in this story. Man's reading, he says, got any yeah, actually, I'm wondering, who is he talking about? And Philip says, well, actually, okay, he's not really talking about himself, Isaiah isn't. This is from Isaiah 53, incidentally. He's not really talking about himself, and he's not really talking about you either. He was actually talking about the Savior. 
who was going to come into the world 700 years later after he wrote this, and who, by the way, has just recently come. Let me tell you about him, Philip says. And we know that from verse 35. Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. Circle those two words, good news. It's a, a derivative of the Greek word euangelion, which is a big fancy way of just saying news of great joy. That's what euangelion meant, news of great joy. And that leads to the third thing that I want to talk about today. And that is evangelism, it's, it's not about your method. It's about the message that we're getting to carry forth. It's not about your method. It's about the message. Let me, let me illustrate. When I was younger, I, I was coached by some wonderful people. They said, the first thing you want to say is this, then you want to say this, then you want to say this, then you want to say this, but you don't want to say this before you say this, because if you say this before you say this, that won't make sense. So, you know, so you gotta, and I was like, oh, there's so much to as I've gotten older, I've come to realize it's, it's really not complicated. It's not formulaic. There's not a, a method that you have to do. You really have one message. It's the gospel, good news. You say, what's the good news? The good news is that God in his graciousness and goodness looked down upon humanity and our sin and in our frailty and he had pity on us and mercy and he sent his only son to this earth to live the perfect life all of us would love to live, but none of us could. And who then died on the cross as your substitute and mine. And then he rose. And even as he rose, he was conquering death. And, and he is saying to anybody who trusts in him, who just says, I'm going to trust in you, Jesus. He is saying, you too will conquer death. You'll live forever. Eternal life. That's the gospel. That's the message. Some of uh, our staff this past week, when I was running through the thoughts, they said, you should draw that picture that you draw sometimes for people. It's a pretty well-worn drawing. You've probably seen it before, but I'll just do it just in, the, in case not, because it, it does tend to make what I just said about the message just very simple. And it gives you a picture that you can carry forward. So you have two sides, two cliffs, and you have this chasm. And on one side, you have God. And on this side, you, you have humanity. And on this side, of course, God is perfect. And, and in him, there's no sin. And he's holy. And on this side, of course, humanity is broken. We're all a mess. We're all infected with sin. Uh, and, and, and shortcomings. And so throughout history, humankind has come along and, and, and instinctively known what this picture is uh, suggesting in their own souls. You can go back for thousands of years. You can look at the hieroglyphics on the walls and people have intuitively known. Something is... It, I got to get to God's, I just can't figure out how to, and so people have come along and they started religions. And some religions come along and say, well, the way that you get to God, here's how you get to God. If you will really be good and you do a little bit more of this or a little bit less of that, and, and then, you're, then that's bound to get you to God, but that doesn't get you to God. And then another person comes along and says, well, no, it's, it's not really even so much about just b being good. It's about being generous. It all has to do with greed. That's it. And so if you'll give up your greed and you'll be generous and you'll give some of your resources away, then that's going to get you back in God's good graces. But that doesn't do it. And then you have people who come along and they started other religions and they said, no, no, no the, the way that you get into God's good favor is you go and you, you, you blow up people. And, just, and I'm not saying that's silly. You know that's true from the news. I mean, it, it, it really is a doctrine of these people. That's how you get in God's good, you kill people, that's it. And that's good, but that doesn't do it. And so throughout history, people have come along and they've started religions and they've said, I, I know this is true, but how do we, well, this is the gospel of Christianity. <sighs> Let 
that in his graciousness, God said, no, 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 here's the deal. You'll never be able to fix this problem. Not from your side, you won't. Because you're too fallen, you're too selfish. Doesn't matter how hard you're, you'll never be able to. So I'm going to fix the problem from my side. And he sends Jesus into this earth to live that life of sinlessness and to die the death and to go to hell for our sake and to rise victoriously, conquering the grave. And so you see, it is God who says, I'll build the bridge. It, it comes from my side, not from your side. That's the good news. And this is what we call the gospel. This, friends, is the game changer. This is, this is what Christianity is about. And it's what separates Christianity from every other world religion. Now, let me anticipate a problem. Many people at this point draw back from sharing their faith because they're afraid of hearing somebody say something along the lines of, well, look, I don't care about you Christians believing what you believe in Jesus and everything. I'll tell you what my problem is, they say. My problem is you shouldn't go around trying to convert other people. That's my problem. Why can't you just, you can believe what you want. Just don't bother us with it. But there's a problem with this problem. Let me tell you what the problem with the problem is. It has to do with this word gospel, okay? Gospel was a word that was used to describe an objective, history-changing event that altered everyone's reality. Everybody had to respond to it. Let me illustrate. We have documented in Greek, and we have a document in Greek that starts like this. This is the beginning of the gospel of Caesar Augustus. You're like, the gospel of Caesar Augustus, what? That's what the word gospel meant. It was an announcement, a proclamation. It was a declaration. In this, this instance, the gospel of Caesar was that Caesar had ascended to the throne and now he was in charge and his heralds went galloping out into all the kingdom uh, and, and they took the message everywhere. Let me tell you the gospel of Caesar. It was news of a history-changing event that affected everyone. You couldn't hear the gospel of Caesar and say, eh, well, you know. It might be your Caesar, but he's not my Caesar, you know. No, you go, no, no, it was an objective history changing. It was just like, no, this is, this is the deal. Everybody had to deal with that gospel. Let me give you another example. Um, it's the same thing from when the Persians were invading Greece. And the Athenian army went out to the plains of Marathon to do battle against the Persians. And everybody expected the Persians are going to overwhelm the Greeks. And so back in Athens, everybody was shaking in their boots, just wake, waiting until the Persians just overran the Greek army and just went, ransacked into Athens and, and just took over. And they're all just, well, it's only a matter of time. Our army's going to get killed out there. And lo and behold, the Greeks actually defeated the Persians. It was this huge upset. And then the victorious Greeks, they're like, whoa, you know what, we got to send word back to Athens because all the people are freaking out and they're probably going to break into looting and there's no telling. They're all, we got to send the word back. So tradition has it that Pheidippides took the run himself and he ran all the way back from Marathon where the battle was fought into Athens, 26.2 miles. He makes that run, why? To proclaim the gospel. The Greeks won. We beat the Persians. And then tradition has it that Pheidippides fell over and died, which is exactly what would happen if I ran a marathon. But anyhow, that'll give you a little background on, on marathon if you're, if you're a, a marathoner. The point is, there were gospels before the gospel of Christianity. There was the gospel of Caesar, the gospel of marathon. And Jesus comes along, and after he rises from the tomb, he says, now I'm sending you with the gospel, not your opinion, not this feeling. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm giving you something that's world changing history. Go now. People need to know it. And as people find out it, they're, 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 they'll, they'll realize, oh my gosh, I can be free. Yes, that's the gospel. You can be free. You can be forgiven. 
You, you, can, you can be set right with our Heavenly Father and not have to wonder, am I all right with God? Did I do enough good things today? Or uh, how's the scales going to tiff? You know? and, no, you can be free from that. You don't have to wonder where you stand with him anymore. You don't have to keep striving to figure out how, how can I please him because I know I need to please him, because I, but I'll never please him. You don't have to worry about that anymore. You don't have to fear death anymore. It's the gospel. You don't have to fear death. You don't have to search for God anymore because Christianity is about a God that said, no, 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 I'm coming to find you. And you don't have to keep making commitment after commitments and say, I'm going to do it better next time and saying over and over and over. I'm going to try harder and I'm going to do it. No, 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 because God said, no, I'm the one who made the commitment to you. And you don't have to keep telling him. Yeah, I'm making a promise. This time, this promise, this time is really for real, really, really real, God, because I'm going to try harder. I'm going to do better because he made a promise to you. This is the gospel. It's the game changer. You get to receive this gift of good news. You just receive it. And you let it count for you. That's Christianity. See, so evangelism isn't a burden that you have to bear. It, it's, a, it, it's, it's a message you get to proclaim. It's not a have to, it's a get to. Don't you see? Um, it, it's, it's like this. Suppose you discover the cure to cancer. You're a scientist and you actually discover the cure to cancer. The last thing I guarantee you that you're going to say is, oh, great. Now we've got to figure out a way to get the message out there that we figured out the cure to cancer. No, that's not what would happen. If you found the cure to cancer, you'd be like, oh, my gosh, this changes everything. Get the news. Get the, just tell the world we figured out how to cure cancer. Right? It's not a have to, it's a get to. Because you'd have the gospel of cancer if that happened. So see, arts isn't the job, friends, of proselytizing. And I think that's where it becomes burdensome. We tend to think, oh, I need to go out and proselytize. No, 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 no. You don't need to go out and proselytize. Arts is the job of good newsing, of, of taking the good news to people, bearing that good news. So relax. Christian. It's really not about you. It's not about your presentation. It's not about your method. It's about a God who says, no, this is all about me and what I've done. You just get to be the messenger. Tell the gospel, the good news of what I've done, what I've done. It changes everything. That's exactly what Philip did that day for the eunuch. Changed everything for that eunuch. That's how it worked for Philip, and that's how it worked for Wanda. You say, who's Wanda? <laughs> Wanda's my mother-in-law. I'll tell you an interesting story about her. Uh, she and my father-in-law, Ed, have big hearts for evangelism, seeing the message go out to people. And a few weeks ago, Wanda and I were sitting at one of my boys' baseball games, and she said, Ken, you know, we've had these family friends for years and years. And, but they've never really had much interest in spiritual things. And, but recently, he, uh, the man, who's now up in his 80s, and apparently his physical is starting to fail a little bit, and he apparently called her up and said, um, Wanda, I would like to get baptized. Do you, know, do you know anybody who could come and baptize me? And instead of taking uh, that inquiry at face value, she asked a good question. And she said to her old friend of decades and decades, well, let me ask you, wh why would you want to get baptized? Do, do you understand what baptism means? Because see, baptism is just only really an outward visible uh, sign that happens to the body of, more importantly, the spiritual inward transformation that's happened inside a person's soul. And so you don't get baptized with your body so that something changes inside your soul. Something changes inside your soul and you embrace the gospel. And then as a sign of that, then you get the baptism. So you want to make sure we got the cart in front of the horse and our horse in front of the cart. And so she asked this question and it led to several conversations and one thing and another, he put his trust 
in Jesus Christ. And she called me yesterday and she said, Ken, I was wondering if we could set up a time when you could come over now and baptize him. Because he's, he's a little old and not able to come here and do the, thing, the celebrations the way we do it here. And I said, absolutely. Now, what led to that? A spiritual question that an individual was asking as people tend to ask at different junctures in their life, which was fielded perfectly with another question that led to more discussion and more conversation that led to an understanding of the gospel. That's how it happened for Wanda. That's how it happened for Philip that day. And that's how it'll happen with you and me. This is something you and I can do. We can do this. So that leads to the very last thing that we're gonna do. We're gonna come to the Lord's table. Because, table, supper is what I'm trying to say. Because um, as we were planning the service, we thought it would be appropriate to remember where we started today. When it comes to evangelism, it's really not about you. It's really not about you. It's about him. And so <clears throat> we go out in the same way that Jesus came to this earth and that night before he went to the cross, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this represents my body. And it's broken for you. And I want you to take it and eat it and do this in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup and he said, this is representative of my blood, which is poured out for the forgiveness of your sins. And I want you to drink it when you come together. And, and so uh, we do that. And, <clears throat> and so uh, this morning as we come, we'll remember it's really about him. That's why we have good news to share. He is the good news. And let me give you one other thing. You'll find on the stations in whatever room that you're, that you're coming, you'll find by the communion elements uh, a little wallet-sized card. We're calling it my top five because sometimes it's just helpful if we can make tangible and sort of take a message like this and make it concrete. And in it, on it, you'll find five lines. And here's what I'm gonna challenge you to do. You take it and you write down five people who are kind of in your circle. You see them regularly, or you talk to them regularly, but you know they don't really have the Lord, but they need the Lord. And you, and it's got some good verses on the backside, and you can just put this in your wallet, and you just begin to pray. Lord, I just pray that you would soften the soil of this person's heart, and this person, and this person, and open up opportunities that we could have a conversation, because I want them to understand the gospel. I want them to get the news. And uh, so you can take one of those cards uh, as you've come and taken the bread and dipped it into the grape juice and partaken. If you need the gluten-free elements, you can go to the outermost sides of whichever room you're in and you can get those elements. And one last question. Sometimes people say, well, can I come if I don't go to church here? This isn't my normal church. <laughs> sure, if you love Jesus. It's not our supper, it's the Lord's supper. And so you just search your own heart and, and ask, uh, do I want to follow after Jesus? And you're invited. Why don't I say a prayer for us and then we'll come. Lord, in the next few minutes, as the musicians come and as we sing and, and continue our worship, we're going to come and we're going to take these tangible symbols of your body and blood, just reminding us of what you did when you came into this world and dying on the cross for us, and rising tremendous good news. It split the calendar into BC and AD. It is absolutely a world-changing event. Forgive us, Lord, for so often sort of wringing our hands and almost feeling guilty or apologetic for the fact we don't really want to talk about it and help us to remember what we talked about today. It's really not about us. It's about something that happened and we've got to get the message out. Won't you give us courage? Won't you give us grace? Won't you give us big hearts full of love? for those that we interact with. Just the same way that you put into Philip's heart a love and a concern for that eunuch that day. Just the way you put into my mother-in-law's heart. Uh, love for that uh, lifelong friend who finally now wanted to understand Christianity. Uh, won't you put that into our hearts as well? Won't you meet with us even now as we come and commune 
with you. And we pray all of these things in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Hello and welcome to Postscript. My name is Adam McIntyre and I am here with Pastor Ken Werlein who just finished up the series on salt and light and I have a few questions for, here, for him today. Uh, thank you so much for being here with us. Uh, my first question um, was about actually your first point that you made about how evangelism is not so much about you, that God is very much involved, that we are just the messengers. And so let me ask you though, do we have any responsibility in how we deliver that message. Yeah, sure. Well, right. Let me answer in two ways. <clears throat> we have a responsibility to play our role. If we don't show up, then it's that's not going to happen. So, so we don't want to totally think in passive ways. Jesus said, "You go into all the world." So, yes, we we've got that role. And then, as I tried to illustrate there is a sensitivity that we're seeking to uh, f f be alert to mm -hmm. that has to do with where certain people are in their journey right. and what's the soil of their heart like and what are they going through. Mm -hmm. if, if it's a person who is in a season of suffering, I, I'm going to be very different about talking about G I'm going to, I definitely am going to put in a good word for the hope that he brings and the promise that he brings, but that's going to be different than if I'm talking to a, uh, a young athlete, mm -hmm. uh, who's feeling good and strong and, but proud and, and maybe still doesn't realize, uh, you need a savior too. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you about this. And so we're trying to, and that's what I tried to illustrate even just with some of the different kinds of questions that can lead conversations in different ways. Right. So we're, we're trying to, we're, we're being faithful to show up and to be participants as the Lord's mouthpieces, as he's nudging us and as he's prompting us. And then we're seeking to, uh, you know, adapt, um, not the truth, the truth stays the same, but the way that we say that. Right. So you're trying to cater the message to particular audiences just to make it more relevant for them. Perfect. Okay, very yeah. cool. And in your second point, you, uh, you said that it's not about our presentation really, it's more about the preparation of the, the heart. hearer's heart. Yeah. And so is there anything that we can do to help prepare others' hearts for the message? Well, <clears throat> yeah, sometimes we wish we could do more and just sort of get inside of them and flip the switch, but it doesn't work that way. We can pray. And throughout scripture, you see, um, you know, Jesus exhorting us to be in prayer. Paul, who would exhort the Christians, I want you to be praying for this and that this message will uh, be received. And so I think that's the most concrete, proactive thing that we can do that somehow in the mystery of God's grace and the, just the way he works, there's a... Uh, a transaction that's happening in the prayer realm. And so we're just praying God soften his heart, soften his heart, soften his heart, soften his heart. Because ultimately only God can soften the heart. Absolutely. Um, though sometimes we really wish we could, we can't do it. And then a lot of people, I think whenever uh, they get the idea in their head of going out and evangelizing, of spreading the good news, um, their biggest fear is being met with hostility. Sure. And so what happens when we go out there and we preach the, the good news and then we are met with that hostility? What should we do from there? Well, that, that's where we go back to, to where we started in the message. Remember, it's not about you. Mm -hmm. It's really not about you. And you remember even Jesus, when he sent out the disciples, he, he said an interesting thing. He said, you're going to look for he was sending him into these different villages and he would say, you look for a man of peace, a person of peace. That is somebody who is a little receptive and maybe they say, well, come on in and you could even stay here, which was customary for hospitality in those days. He said, so start with the, with the person of peace, right. but not everybody's going to be a person of peace. 
And so you will be met with hostility. What did Jesus say in that situation? He said, in those situations, you'll just have to shake the dust off your feet. Move on. Don't quit. Right. Just move on and keep knocking. And you're going to find a person who is a, man of, who is a person of peace who will give you inroad and you can start in with them and then he'll have relationships and he'll want, as he comes to know Christ, he'll want those people to come to know Christ and, and on we go from there. Very nice. Well, Pastor Ken, thank you so much for being here and thank you all for tuning into Postscript this week. We will see you all next week. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org slash postscript.